humble obeisances maharaj thank you very much for joining today it's a pleasure and honor to have you hari krishna hari krishna it's my pleasure to be with you again prabhu yes maharaj so this dashavatar it was a very sweet what we did last time and quite often till now in the monks podcast we have been discussing more contemporary and analytical topics of course our discussion of the chautar was also analytical uh-huh. but it was the core topic was itself quite scriptural uh-huh. and devotional so when you devoted i appreciated that yeah. as we move forward to the later avatars they are looking forward to it more and more probably when we come to krishna we will have a lot to discuss <laughs> so thank you very much for sparing your time <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you very much for sparing your time my pleasure <clears throat> yes maharaj so yeah we we are this is churning <clears throat> churning the nectar yes maharaj so yes last time we discussed about uh, uh, matsya the first so should we discuss about kurma today maharaj why not why not yes <laughs> so yes do you have some framework or should we go according to the bhagavatam i thought of two three things i thought of one way is we try to look at what are the distinctive features of that of each avatar or the, the leela of each avatar and then we could highlight those or we could just go linearly along the past time and discuss that pa- discuss various aspects as they come up how would, or do you have any structure in mind how you would like to do this I don't have I don't have myself so you're welcome to to go as as you are inclined you said you have two or three thoughts yes maharaj um to start with yeah so let's go with that okay so so one way i thought is we could look at what are the distinctive features of this avatar and then we could go along linearly mm-hmm. after that so okay But one of the things i noticed is that from what i read kurma does he ever talk does he certainly there is no instruction that kurma gives but i was talk. i was thinking about that also and i was trying to remember i didn't have time to check um yeah whether <clears throat> whether there's some direct speech by him um as far as i could see there's a verse in the t- there there's a verse in the 12th canto um but i don't think it's kurma speaking directly it's talking about the itch on his back those who uh what is it those who read the bhagavatam are blessed by by lord by the lord who had an itch on his back something like that yeah but no i I was thinking about that also. He's a very silent um uh, he's a very silent avatar. That's true. So I also did a quick search in the Bhagavatam. We don't uh, see him speaking per se. So that was one feature. Another feature is that uh, this is a the Kurma Leela has many other avatars also coming in. they may be one of the dash avatars or they may not be the dash avatars but uh, there are other manifestations yeah. of vishnu also that appear mohini murti comes immediately yes and also ajita who comes uh, who yeah. holds the mandar from above so in a sense this is like yes. a, uh, this is probably a one of the few past times where we have multiple avatars uh, populating the same past time and cooperating with each other cooperating that's a good word i was thinking that yeah. i think ram and parshuram meet in the in the ramayan and they have a conflict so yes then ram sends parshuram away to the mountains basically so cooperate yes. that's striking there are no other places where other the places where avatars meet per se um, live alone cooperate actually each avatar has his own time uh, I... so then huh each avatar has his own time so they will own time at, yeah they'll come at their time and they will go 
So in that sense, so yeah. the, their cooperation becomes a little unlikely. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, maybe, perhaps in the spiritual world they are all together <laughs> discussing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, Nrsinghade, it's your turn to go. <laughs> <laughs> your turn to go. <laughs> That's interesting. In, as far as I remember, the Brihad Bhagavata Amrita, there is a disc. I don't know if people from one Vaikuntha planet go to another Vaikuntha planet. The Gopa Kumar goes because he is evolving. But uh, in this yeah. world, whether the whether the Ayodhya Vasis go to Dwarka or Dwarka Vasis go to near the other vishnu planets that would be a, we don't have that much specific descriptions from what i have seen isn't it no mm. <clears throat> no and um i just re i was just reading a couple of days ago in briyad bhagavat amrita there's this very interesting situation in goloka uh where Kaliya serpent reappears in uh, in the lake in the Hrada, and Krishna goes after him to have some more fun, and of course all all the residents, all the Brajvasis are again totally disturbed, and eventually Balaram comes. And he he pleads with Krishna uh, to stop putting everyone in such distress, <laughs> and and his and his reason is these are the bridge bhasis; these are not the residents of Dwaraka or Vaikuntha. Uh, they could, you know, those residents they might be able to to manage, so to say. <laughs> but here, the residents of Raj, it's too much for them. You, you're, you're, you're destroy. you know, it's too painful. So please stop. <laughs> so he's, he's making that very uh, definite distinction between the residents. That's fascinating. On the other hand, um, on the other, I mean, this is getting off the subject of Kurma, but it occurs to me that uh, Srila Rupa Goswami, doesn't he uh, explain that, um, uh, that the wives of Krishna are expansions of the gopis? Yes. Uh, that... Uh, Rukmini is uh, is Chandravali and uh, sorry Satyabhama is Radharani. Yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. yeah. Yeah. So so there is some interaction definitely, but so some kind of connection is there. Yes, that's true. And of course, Krishna meets Mahavishnu in the tenth canto of the Shrimad Bhagavatam when he's trying to get the Brahmana's son. So now Mahavishnu is not exactly an avatar. Yeah. Mahavishnu is more of a universal administrator. So mm. now one reason of, we could say that why there is an interaction with Parashuram is because Parashuram also has a long life. According to some traditions, he's still living. So, but at least at the Bhagavatam says he's yes. still living. So that could be one factor. Now, yes. In one sense, if we see uh, that from Matsya to Kurma, it's more like from water to land. The Matsya is more of a aquatic and Kurma is more amphibious. Mm. So although there is no description of Kurma yes. coming on the land, he, he's quite huge. So Kurma and Matsya both are relatively <laughs> speaking quite huge avatars. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yes, and, and um, I I looked it up um, in one book. 
tortoises, turtles in general, tortoises, also these uh, sea-going sea tortoises, um, apparently they need to come up for air. They don't, they're not, so they're not actually fish. Um, but they can stay underwater as long as uh, half an hour. Okay. So, yeah, amphibious. So we talked about this. Was it Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur or was it Bhakti Vinod Thakur who made this suggestion of the avatars being indicating a, a kind of evolutionary development? Yes. I think both or of them. reflecting an evolutionary development. Yeah. Both of them both. talk about it. Okay. Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur talks about it in one of his conversations with his. Uh, with that English uh, pro British professor who has come to meet him, and uh, Bhakti uh -huh. I think mentions it. Uh, I don't remember which book it is in now. So the way he puts it is more that it's more like a creative correlation rather than a substantiation of evolution per se. That. That even the avatars, right. the idea like like Prabhupada also correlated evolution with spiritual evolution. So it seems that yeah, although the word had different meanings in the Western academic or scientific sense, the word mm -hmm. is used by our acharyas creatively in different ways. So yeah. Prabhupada uses yeah. it more for the they're they're using it more. More in a playful way. Playful way, okay. Yeah, that's... A... Would you call Prabhupada's usage also as playful? Because Prabhupada applies it more for the soul. The Bhakti Sans Rakur and Bhakti Rathakur apply it more for the... Uh, more for the... Like the avatars. So I think that might be a little more playful. Prabhupada's use is talking about a philosophical truth of the soul's evolution. So... Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he's, he, of course, Prabhupada is speaking of development of the soul's consciousness Yes. Uh, over time as a kind of evolution. That's true. And uh, when we talk about, uh, so the, when you say playfully, it's basically, he's saying that, that the idea of evolution, okay, it's here also. That doesn't necessarily mean that we support the biological way evolution was proposed, but that concept itself is over here. So is it that the Lord chooses to manifest in a particular historical sequence, uh, which, which reflect, is reflective of the evolution of human, of not necessarily of the evolution of consciousness because last time we discussed that aquatics are put at the lowest level. And then it's interesting when he's talking yeah. about var Varaha also, uh, Hiranyaksha refers to him, at least Prabhupada translated it as an amphibious beast. So when, Vara when Hiranyaksha yeah. refers to Varaha, <laughs> oh, an amphibious beast. So yeah. he recognizes his Vishnu, but he says, you have yeah. come as an amphibious beast. So both of them are amphibious, but then... Yeah, but the Varaha seems to live more on the land also. I, I mean, a boar lives much more on the land than the turtle. Yeah. So we could say that there is some kind of... Yes, uh, we know, have... Yes. Sorry, you are saying... We something? have boars living... We have boars living in the forest right next to where I'm living right now. Oh, okay. And you can see their... You can see their tracks in the mud. Oh. I go for walks here and in the forest. You can see their tracks. Interesting. So they're la very much land animals. Yeah. So about evolution, um, my understanding is the our acharyas would say, well, everything comes originally from the Lord. Uh, so the notion of evolution, that's also coming from the Lord. Uh, and so the Lord is um, 
appearing in this sequence. And this is indicative uh, of a progression, which then we are seeing, we are perceiving in a different way, in the modern, in the modern way that different forms of life are developing over time. Hmm. So we could say it's and almost, so the yeah. acharyas would be it, the acharyas would be saying that um, <clears throat> any idea of evolution that we have, you can trace it back uh, to the Lord, but there you will find it, it's a very different idea because. It's not that something new is developing, um, but rather there's simply a sequence of appearance. Yes. So it could almost be said that uh, like, a, like the great saints, they remember, Krishna, they see everything and remember Krishna. So it is the Acharyas look at the theory of evolution also, and they remember the Lord by looking at the Lord's sequence. So it's, it could also be seen more like a Uddipan for remembering Krishna. Like one way is that everything comes yeah. from Krishna. Another way, mm-hmm. yeah. So now the, the kurma is, as seen, it is often asso- he's associated with stability. I think even uh, yes. Bhaktivinoda Thakur told Bhaktisanth Thakur to worship Kurma Dev in his childhood. Mm-hmm. He had his own deity. Yes. So. so now, at a, when the churning begins, so there is, at the like we're talking about multiple incarnations, the demons and the devatas are fighting and then they go, devatas go to Vishnu and Vishnu tells them to make a truce. So that is the first intervention of Vishnu, but that is more of a, a standard cosmic intervention wherever the devatas are in trouble, they go to Vishnu. But then when they start the churning, it, uh, the Bali, Bali is there and Indra are there, they start churning. So at that time, the Lord appears. And there is no specific de- description that the devatas or anyone is offering prayers to him or glorifying him. As far, At least not in the Bhagavatam from what yeah. I know. So they just start churning and then the Lord seems to be there to stabilize. So uh, to stabilize the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> The churning rod. So it seems that this churning, churning uh, uh, has a lot of uh, a lot of uh, metaphorical significance also in many different ways. And oh yeah, yeah. So so the Lord, he is so it's the ocean that is being churned, but the Lord is helping the ocean to be churned. So we could say that in one sense. Uh, if we consider the ocean to be like our heart and the Lord is also present in our heart and whatever we do Mm. to try to purify our heart, all our efforts are ultimately sustained by him itself. So Mm. that is, that is the the Lord's presence, which enables the churning. And uh, then the churning rod from what I have, I have not seen Prabhupada developing the metaphorical explanation so much, but I have seen other devotee speakers talk about no. it quite a lot. So, yeah. In general, it seems uh, Prabhupada. Yeah. Prabhupada did not go too much into metaphorical explanations. Is there any reason that you feel for that? Uh, the reason I see is that Prabhupada wanted to emphasize a literal explanation because he wanted uh, to get away from the idea uh, of reducing yeah. everything to you know fantasy and myth, mythology. He he would often say something like this is itihasa itihasa means history mm. and he would equate it um, he would actually identify all of all of the pastimes everything in the bhagavatam bhagavad gita 
as historical fact, we know he would emphasize with the Bhagavad Gita that there is a place called Kurukshetra. This is where there was a real battle. Uh, it's not to be, he was of course arguing especially against uh, against Mahatma Gandhi, yeah. uh, who was taking it in an allegorical way. Mm -hmm. But then uh, I think we talked about this before. Uh, we know uh, um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur does speak about allegoric, he does give allegorical meanings to Krishna Leela. Um, and why he's doing that is an interesting question also. Um, I think there may be an historical element to it. I mean, a historical factor of Bhaktivinoda Thakur's particular time and uh, who he was kind of, who is in, in the background of his, uh, his culture, especially, uh, mm, what's his name? I'm forgetting his name. Bank um, Chatterjee. Bankim Chatterjee. Bankim Chatterjee. Bankim Chatterjee. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. Yeah, uh, who wrote a book uh, called, I think, Krishna Charita. Yes. And he, uh, in that book, he tried to. Um, he sort of bowdlerized. He tried to. Bodler you know, that's a good clean word. up what he yeah. thought was not pure. Yeah. yeah it's called bowdlerization. Yes. <clears throat> and Bhaktivinoda Thakur, you know, around the same time, he's, he's writing what he's writing. And he's saying, yes, you can take Krishna's pastimes uh, allegorically, to a certain extent, but he's saying, it seems he's saying uh, that doesn't mean only allegorically. They're also literal. So Krishna kills Agasura. There is a demon Agasura, Krishna kills it, uh, mm. and so on. Yeah. But why Srila Prabhupada emphasized uh, the, the literal um this was his mood he was he was uh he was relishing everything in a mainly mainly literal way but not only literal because we see sometimes in a purport he will give a kind of not explicitly but he will give uh a purport that's suggesting an allegorical meaning. The, the one kind of famous example comes to mind from, uh, what is it, Canto 8, um, Gajendra Leela. Yes. Uh, Gajendra is fighting the, uh, the alligator, Krish, uh, and Prabhupada speaks about this lake, uh, as in an allegorical way, in terms of ashrama. Hmm. When he says uh, one should be in a situation, in an ashram situation, which is favorable, in which one can be most strong for serving Krishna. That he's taking uh, Gajendra as an example of one who is in a situation in which he was disadvantaged. Yes. So that's a kind of allegorical interpretation. Yes, I think Prabhupada and, uh, also in the 10th canto is talking about the children of Devaki. Devaki. He says the six uh, children who are killed represent the six Anarthas. And then after that, yeah. the master comes. That's, there also, that's from the Atharyas, from Vishwanath Thakur, yes. I think. Yeah, but Prabhupada does repeat that. Mm. From what I have seen, Prabhupada doesn't in the Krishna yeah. 
or in the 10th canto whatever purport is written prabhupada doesn't refer to bhakti no thakur's uh, description of uh, demons in krishna leela in, in allegorical terms so i haven't seen prabhupada refer to that no i don't think so so what was so what you are giving eighth canto example no. we could say what prabhupada does himself so it's not that prabhupada is quoting acharyas but prabhupada is doing it himself yeah that's significant so we can say i think we could find other examples yes uh, there may, i think i'm sure <laughs> but i can't that, uh, think of any now yeah prabhupada does uh, the prabhupada sometimes does very direct uh, it's not a, i don't know whether you can call it allegorical the seventh canto when uh, there is that verse which prahlad maharaj says my senses are pulling me in different direction jiv vaik to achu to vikarshati ma vitrupta so my eye mm. tongue is pulling me in one direction eyes are pulling in another direction the ears are pulling in another direction so prabhupada directly makes the translation over there as the ears are attracted to radio songs so so that is <laughs> so i think prop it's almost like a very implied the ears are attracted to some attractive music prova makes it radio songs over there so we could say that yeah yeah so in one sense the essential point is to make the teaching relevant so if sometimes the way to make it relevant is to emphasize yeah. the literal that's what can be done if sometimes the non literalist is the way it makes yeah. it relevant then that can be done so while you are mentioning my yes. yeah exactly yes ma'am so while you are mentioning i was thinking uh, uh what is the difference between say metaphorical and allegorical so from what i understand allegory refers more to a story uh, there's a whole long narrative and the story itself symbolizes something yeah say maybe like the pilgrim's progress is a allegory hmm is it or no yes allegory be. allegory is allegory is um is a narrative it's it's uh generally a narrative i my understanding yes and um there there can be also extended um extended analogies so for example uh the 8th <clears throat> chapter adi lila chaitanya charitamrita is an extended analogy uh of the the tree of uh of chaitanya chaitanya's associates yes that's true and um it's it's an analogy and it's extended which means it has it goes on many it can be used in many different ways true so true so so we could say that uh, allegory usually involves a story and in sometimes within a story you can also have metaphorical elements so a particular point represents particular yeah. thing that would be metaphorical and uh, so then we could broadly call yeah. all of these as allegorical or metaphorical all these we could call as non literal readings we could all put them in the yeah in the in the category of non literal but but we also have in the bhagavatam we have at least one explicit uh allegory and that is the story of puranjana yes puranjana yeah and it's specified also beforehand that it is a allegory so it's very explicit yeah and uh, it's explicit and then after it's described then he goes back and he identifies ev- every element of the story as meaning this that and the other thing yes that's true so it does seem that in the past uh, often allegory was a was a frequently employed tool for teaching jesus uh, uses he uses parables but he also uses allegories at times the prodigal mm-hmm. son would also be an allegory allegory so 
now when we say bhaktinath thakur represents uh, bhaktinath thakur says that putana represents a false guru so would would we call that as a metaphor or would we call that as allegory allegory mm <clears throat> um <laughs> i don't know it's uh because it's a narrative i would say you can keep it in the category of allegory okay um yeah the thing is there there's also a sense in which allegorical uh narratives you have persona you have personifications of abstract concepts and so that's very much the case in all of these uh stories of krishna killing the demons um uh, but another example is chaitanya chandradai nataka of kavi karnapura mm. in which there's the personified bhakti personified dharma personified kali uh personified adharma is there dharma there's adharma in any case there is uh, there's personified fri- friendship uh and so on yeah okay so that's that's um i would say that's kind of classical allegory uh mm-hmm. where they are speaking as um as kali as a dharma and so on that's their whole identity yes so then uh, the story of the there's also the story in pad in padma purana mm mm-hmm. uh the the story of of bhakti devi and gyana and vairagya what is it gyana and yoga vairagya yeah gyana and vairagya yeah so that's definitely allegorical now i personally see also the story of uh the cow and the bull in the first canto with kali uh there's also a certain a strong allegorical element there yeah now this raises a few questions that uh, in our tradition we also consider bhakti to be a goddess so so there is a or at least we have rinda devi who is there in uh, vrindavan you have yoga maya i don't know whether gopal champu actually talks about bhakti devi as a person specifically but bhakti devi does seem to be a presence in our in our tradition so are we saying that bhakti devi uh when we say the story is allegorical can we also have if we have historical characters in non historical roles then that can also be allegory because uh, it does seem uh, just to go back to your uh, the last point which you mentioned about the story in the first canto there is a historical character parikshit maharaj who seems to meet this cow and bull and then there is also the i don't know whether we call kali also a historical character uh, so kali is considered to be either a being of some kind i don't know whether every other yuga also has that personified being is there sat- satya and dwapar and treta <laughs> <laughs> the personality of satya you know yeah. i don't know mm. yeah i think what's happening is there's a lot of blurring of categories to the point where mm. it sort of doesn't matter anymore you you sort of you just become absorbed in what's happening in the narrative and you don't really worry about um is this historical is this allegorical it doesn't matter anymore <laughs> mm. cow cows and bulls are speaking perfect sanskrit why not <laughs> 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 everything is possible everything is possible Okay. 
So in a sense, we need to become bhavagrahi, you know, or saragrahi rather, saragrahi, yeah. essence seekers. Mm. Yeah. And, and it does seem that from what I have saragrahi. said, saragrahi. Saragrahi, yeah. We, Vishnu is is bhavagrahi. We are we want to become saragrahi. Yes, true. So it does seem that this question doesn't uh, uh, even. It doesn't really exercise the previous acharyas. Vishwanath Chakradakur, he does explain in his his commentaries are not very big, but in his Bhagavad commentaries, wherever there is anything which may be a little confusing, he does address that. Okay, this character is saying like this, but this is what it means. But this question, he doesn't address it. So it seems that, like what you said, it it didn't matter for them so much. Yeah, it's it's hard for us to go back to uh, to that time uh, to sort of to really understand how how the acharyas were thinking. Yeah, and maybe we're not supposed to, <laughs> but um, from a mundane perspective, you could say, well, we're talking about basically pre-modern. Uh, culture and uh, certain issues that for us are very important were simply not not issues at that time. Mm -hmm. And similarly, things for us um, maybe two hundred years from now, they'll say why why these people were not thinking about this or that something else they'll be very worried about <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> so these these the this is uh one aspect of changing times yes um back to korma yes Mara, just if i uh, may yes please <laughs> yeah <laughs> Since i think we're we talking went, about korma we went on, i think we went on and, this whole detour because I mentioned that karma, kurma represents stability, and then we discussed whether that Prabhupada didn't mention meta, metaphorical meaning so much. So that's how we went. I yeah. think it was, it was relevant, but yeah, we, let's come back now. Thank you. Well, speaking of stability, uh, in Vaishnav ritual, one of the first steps uh, of performing uh, archana puja in the morning is to establish the asana. Om asana mantrasya meru prishti. I forget the mantra. Uh, and then om adhara shaktiye namaha, om anantaya namaha, om kurmaya namaha. Oh. So first one um, offers obeisance to adhara shakti, the supporting shakti. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to Ananta, and then to Kurma. And this is when you're establishing the asana. Uh, but this is interesting also from a historical perspective. You can look this up on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. You can just search um, turtles all the way down. And there's a whole history to this uh, notion. It was sometimes used by Europeans in a, uh, in a derisive way uh, to speak about people of, uh, of India, South, South Asia. Oh, they, you know, they have strange ideas of cosmology, turtles all the way down. But that that expression uh, also goes back several hundred years. <laughs> uh, it's been used, um, well, at least 200 years, and, I, and they say possibly more. But it's become uh, a kind of common expression there. I think it says uh, it's used to express the idea of infinite regress. Yes, Maharaj. So it seems that ah, you found yes, infinite regress, and it says that it's eighteen thirty as early as eighteen thirty eight. It goes and uh, yeah, 
now this background in hindu mythology and then then the notable modern allusions or variations in fact but there's there's see also seems to be a book by that my name that was the first hit that came on google when i looked at it <laughs> so is the world turtle that is basically referring to kurmadev or is it referring to something else well it it's yeah it's understood um but there's so many within what we call vedic literature broadly speaking mm. um there's so many references to uh tortoise and i was going to say there's another connection here namely with kashyapa kashyapa is uh the prajapati who is the son of marichi i believe yes and he is the father of both diti and aditi so he's the father of both the demons uh the daityas and uh and the suras yeah and kashyapa is identified with kurma yes i also heard about this and uh, so so in fact that is an alternate so it makes sense so it makes sense if he is a prajapati <clears throat> because there is this notion of world creation right as having a foundation and the foundation in this case uh is is a tortoise but is a prajapati and that prajapati is creating the demons and the demigods oh okay beautiful so in that sense is the actually when you say turtles all the way down it is although that might be used in a derogatory sense or a pejorative sense but it has a the idea is that ultimately there the universe has to have a foundation and if that turtle is transcendental then he is the ultimate foundation and even from a genealogical perspective there is a prajapati who starts everything so yeah that's quite a and all of this all of this also points to uh the pastime of the churning of the ocean is actually also a creation story creation story how is that well it's creating so many different okay. items okay okay uh ultimately it's creating uh the the nectar of immortality but before that so many items and persons and divinities are appearing mm. if if we don't say creation then recreation because okay the world is already there the ocean is there and uh the earth is there already um but um it's it's a further creation it's a it's a kind of visarga yes it's uh that's happening through through an effort of churning and this churning i want to say is also echoing an activity in the in the yagya ritual and that is the creation of fire in the fire in the yagya how do they make fire they churn uh with arni wood and the other and that um by that friction uh fire is created so so this is another churning that goes on and as far as the structure of the bhagavatam goes i think it's also significant you know how much i like uh mandalas and yantras yes so this is a kind of mandala that's being described um and you know it's the center pole within a mandala and kurma is 
we can say completing that mandala or make, making the, the foundation of the mandala out of which then the churning process of uh, churning Krishna kata can take place. <laughs> That's a lot to process. <laughs> can, you, can you elaborate that a little bit more? Maybe before that. Yeah, well, uh, it's, just, it's sorry, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm jumping me. into something allegorical a little That's bit. That's fine. Just before that, Maharaj, but, you know, in general, maybe for Prabhupada doesn't talk so much about mandalas directly in his purports. So maybe right. we, we do use the word Raja Mandala or uh, governmental Parikrama. So can you just yeah. briefly explain mandala in this context? And then we can go deeper okay. into well, the word mandala, a Sanskrit word, simply means circle. And we see quite a fair number of circles in the Bhagavatam. Um, there's one mandala is, is hinted at uh, in the first canto uh, with, uh, with Naimisharanya. Naimisharanya is described as kind of a center point of the world or of the universe. And then you have 60,000 sages and they're all surrounding uh, Sutta Goswami, who is, of course, speaking the Bhagavatam as he heard it from Shukadev Goswami. So that's, that's a kind of mandala. So and then... Um, just a minute. So, are we saying here that uh, uh, the conception of the universe described there is a mandala with like Naimisharanya at the center of the universal wheel? Or are you talking about the sages who are sitting in a mandala? Or what exactly are you referring to here? Well, we'd have to check exactly what it says. I don't have it in my mind. Yeah. Um, but there's some notion of, of uh, Naimisharanya being the, the center. It's, it's, it's the yes. point at the center. So if it's the center, that means there's, there, that implies something surrounding, right? Okay, so that and is a reference that to mandala. Implies, okay. That's a kind of mandala. Yes, that is true. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. And then in the um, in the fifth canto, we have Bhu Mandala. Yes. Described quite extensively with all the mountains and the seas. And that's very much a mandala. It's um, it's very it's circular and it also has square portions um, and so on. So it's describing what looks very much like many classical yantras, which have both square, angular, and, and circular elements. Okay. So that's in the fifth canto. And then here, this is, this is eighth canto. Just one minute. How do you correlate yantra and mandala over here? Yantra mandala is more a circle, and yantra can be various shapes, or shapes which symbolize something. Yeah, yantras can be in many shapes, but typically um, they will be a combination of square elements and circles. Um, and there may be also triangles. It's, you know, there's tantric yantras, especially in tantric traditions, they use a lot of yantras as, uh, as tools for meditation. Tantric Buddhism, they use a lot of yantras. So um, I was gonna say in the eighth canto, then uh, it seems to me that this pastime of churning the ocean is uh, hinting at a kind of mandala. 
because of the way it's set up with Kurma and uh, Sumeru and uh, Vishnu and then the churning process. And uh, then in the 10th canto, of course, we have Rasa Mandala. So we can say that all the mandalas before we get to the 10th canto are preparing us uh, for this 10th canto, uh, the central mandala, the Rasa Mandala. Hmm. The mandal is the Ras mandal is actually literally circular also, and then they dance in that formation. So it's fascinating. I never thought of how prevalent the mandal is even in the Bhagavatam. Okay. And the 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 Bhagavatam as a whole, I think, can be conceived as a kind of mandala um, where. Uh, you you read from first canto through the twelve cantos. You get to the twelfth. You come to the end of the twelfth canto. What do you do? You go back to the beginning of the first canto. Mm. So it's a circle. And in the center of the circle is the tenth canto. And you may say, wait, wouldn't it be canto six because there's twelve? No, it's Canto t- 10, certainly, because uh, the focus is Krishna. Yeah. So then, so you are saying that this would be more like a conceptual center rather than a chronological center. That 10th Canto would be more of a, because it is, the whole Bhagavatam's heart is the 10th Canto and Krishna. Yeah, everything is uh, leading up. It's either leading up to the 10th canto or uh, relating to the 10th canto one way or another. Yes. Everything is a preparation uh, or a reflection of, we can say, the 10th canto. We we can see that if we, uh, especially I think if we, if we focus on rasa, uh, we can see expressions of the feelings. Um, the different rasas are manifested uh, in the different relations with the, with different avatars in the course of uh, of the Bhagavatam, and then it's all leading into, um, yeah, the Maharasa. Of the Bhagavad, of the tenth canto. Hmm. That's beautiful. For example, for example, in the beginning of Canto three, uh, we meet Uddhava, and Uddhava has just before meeting Vidura, he has been with Krishna, and now Krishna has left. Hmm. We're only in the third canto, <laughs> um, but Krishna has left. So the time element is also interesting in the Bhagavatam. Uh, it's kind of, we get all kinds of reversals of time. We have different sorts of time. And what is his mood? His, he's feeling great pain of separation. Yeah. Because Krishna has just departed. So that viraha bhava is expressed in his memories of Krishna's pastime, which he's summarizing in, uh, what is it, chapters 2, 3, and 4. Yeah. Remembrance of Lord Krishna. That, that's the chapter of the right hand. Yeah. Those chapters, yes. So that's, you can also think of that as an anticipation uh, of the tenth canto, anticipation of the gopis' feeling of feelings of separation. Yes. Anyway, um, back to Kurma yes. and back to the churning. Yeah. So we can also think about how churning 
Where else do we find churning happening in the Bhagavatam? Well, how about uh, when uh, in Damodar Leela, Krishna yes. and Mother Yashoda, Mother Yashoda is churning milk. So we can say that the whole churning um, episode in the eighth canto is an anticipation of that. Mm. Of, Krish, of Krishna and Mother Yashoda and that Leela. Um, and that and that churning yeah the churning of the ocean of milk is um, of course creating a nectar but the nectar of immortality which then the demons and demigods are fighting over and what does what does Krishna do with the nectar in the 10th canto. Krishna eats the He's bhai. breaking the pots, he's stealing it, and he's giving it freely. He's giving it to the monkeys even. Okay. So, so it's a very, it's, a, it's an interesting inversion. It's a kind of inversion. In, in the eighth canto, it's all about who's in control and and so on. Um, it's about Dharma. You know, the demigods are followers of Dharma. And the demons are not followers of Dharma. And then Krishna, what does he do? He breaks the pot, very undharmic thing. And he's, he's a thief, very undharmic. Mm. So we could say that that eighth canto churning is for establishing dharma, whereas the 10th canto churning is, it transcends dharma and it is for relishing prema. It is simply the reciprocation of love. Mm. Yes, but in the 8th canto, the establishing of dharma is also kind of questionable because what happens? Um, Mohini Murti is... Um, She's not keeping her word. What kind of dharma is that? She says she's going to distribute the nectar to everyone, and then she takes it and gives it to the uh, to the demigods only. Yes, that's true. And in fact, there is some anticipation of that before also, when Vishnu tells Indra that you. Right now you are weak, so you may form a you make a truce with the demons and you churn the milk, uh, churn the milk, uh, churn the ocean, milk ocean, and then I think there the uh, the that the, the snake, uh, there's the, that example of a of a, a rat and, no of a rat and a snake that uh, person. Oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea is that we well, use. <clears throat> We use the hole, yeah. We <laughs> yeah, whoever makes the hole, yeah, the that was and then we that drive them and use the hole. So so in a sense that is prefigured yeah. over there. So it it some ways is similar to the Mahabharat. Some it seems uh, in general, in times of like intense battles with the demons or demoniac forces, sometimes the ethos seems to be more of contextual ethics. But sometimes the uh, ends justify the means. So like Krishna has uh, yeah. Karna killed in a particular way or Bhishma or Drona killed in a particular way. So even Duryodhana. Yes. So, so we could say that the yeah. end is establishing dharma. The means themselves may not be exactly dharmic. But at least the, the, at, the end of this, at the end of that whole narrative, the devatas do gain power. And uh, it's by the 10th, 11th chapter of the 8th canto, the demons are killed. And then after that, uh, Shukracharya performs the Yajna by which he revives Bali Maharaj. And then after that, the Vamandeva pastime starts. So, so that churning, it's, it's significant. So you said that the theme of mandala is recurrent in the Bhagavatam and churning is also recurrent in the Bhagavatam. 
Now, I I just missed. How did you correlate Mandal and uh, churning? Are you saying that the ocean is? What is the Mandal over there? Um, again, we have a center point, a kind of bindu in the churning rod. Okay. And 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 they're circling around. They're pulling Vasuki. They're surrounding and so on. So that's also a kind of mandala, mm. you know, to some. That's true. Mm. You know, it just struck me right now. It's not an entirely similar thing, but just as Krishna is a non-combatant in the Mahabharat Kurukshetra war, which is for establishing mm. dharma, uh, similarly, Kurma is not exactly non-combatant, but he is he is non-active. But although yeah. but although Krishna in one sense does everything at all the critical moments, he is there to help, and without him, mm. the war couldn't have been won. So similarly, all the Kurma, he is as you said earlier, he is a silent avatar, but still he is maintaining everything and is ensuring that everything happens. He so and it's it's also <clears throat> it's also described uh, that um, the Lord expands his energy into uh, the demons and the demigods. Uh, yeah. to facilitate the pastime. And into Vasuki so, also. Yeah. So into, Vas into Vasuki, Vasuki also. Vasuki makes him inactive. And then the dev devtas are energized with the mode of with Sattva and uh, Asuras with Rajas. And it's yeah. interesting. Basically, they are pulling from both sides. So it seems that Sattva and Rajas, from a functional point of view, can equate each other. Although sometimes we say sattva might be too <laughs> contemplative, but here the devtas are having sattva, yeah. the, but they both balance the churning and they keep churning. So it yeah. seems that in a sense that the mode doesn't necessarily affect the energy level. The mode is more about how we conduct ourselves or what is the disposition. So even in sattva, a person can have as much energy as in rajas. But the person will not be that attached or that entangled. The mentality will be different. The activity level can be the same. Yes, that could you could put it like that. But in this in this case, I wonder how. Although although we say that mm, the devas are sattvic, I wonder how sattvic they were in this particular occasion. Uh, because they were very much motivated to gain uh, the nectar, the amrit. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> and and you can say they were quite attached to getting it. That's true. Yeah. So and much so that so much so that when Varahadev, sorry, when Rahu uh, tried to intercept, uh, he lost his head. They didn't. They didn't waste time. They just uh, whew, off with his head. But wasn't that Mohini Murti? It was not the Devatas exactly. Yeah. Mohini Murti cut off her head. Yeah. So, but yeah. So now the Devatas did they want the nectar to become stronger or just to live? Because normally the soma they say that they drink it so that they can prolong their lifetime. Mm. Usually. But uh, here, the nectar was so that they could become stronger, isn't it? And then when they become stronger, that's how they were able to defeat the demons. Oh, is that what it says? I th I thought. Okay, I I th I thought you know they understand that this is Amrita, so this is going to give us immortality. Um, oh, okay. I I don't remember now. Yeah, because what I do remember is that even with the Amruta, uh, because I'm just looking at, okay, I'll just share this screen. Even with the Amrut, they are not exactly immediately able to win the war. Because uh, even then, there is a battle between the demigods and the demons. And although the de devtas win initially, but after that, it seems that they start uh, 
uh, they start losing and that's when <laughs> in the it seems that in the chapter 10 chapter 11 again the lord appears on the battlefield and then at the end of chapter 10 and he kills some of the prominent demons and then indra becomes enlivened and then indra kills all the demons so the lord appears many times in this chapter or in this whole past time yeah and uh, and in general we can say it's it's all part of the back and forth of the demons and the demigods yes um which which if we take allegorically again we can say this is always our internal battle yes it's a actually it's an internal battle and it's also an external battle like the external world also even if there are no it, there are always godly and ungodly forces and uh, there is no like a uh, there's no final solution there is dharma is more of <laughs> dharma is establishing dharma is more of balancing rather than eliminating mm-hmm. yes yeah yeah so, that's true now when the i, I mm-hmm. had two, two three thoughts about this so when kurma the, so at this past times of the lord there is a there is a functional aspect to it or i don't know whether functional is the right word or you could say there is a aspect of the lord doing a particular so, uh fulfilling a particular function or purpose in the world and there is a transcendental aspect to it so from a functional perspective he is bearing the burden of the mandara parvat and he is uh, he is ensuring the churning happens from the transcendental perspective it is said that uh, actually the churning it it gives the lord a very pleasant tickling sensation it like somebody if they can't reach their back and tickle uh, mm-hmm. and they have some scratch so in the jaydev goswami's uh, prayers it is said that there is a because of the churning on his back a small depression is created by the mm. mark of the mandara so but the depression doesn't seem to be it it seems to be like a pleasant experience for him so there is a functional aspect and there is a transcendental aspect to while yes. he, even while carrying a whole mountain on his back so now when we say he stabilizing uh it is resting on him and then they are pulling so the burden is definitely to some extent on him uh, the weight is on him yes so the vasuki is actually they are not the rope can say not, yeah go ahead please <clears throat> well another point is just that um the lord is taking the humble position um by going down to the lowest place and and supporting um and um facilitating the whole pastime he's taking the humble position he's stepping down avatar avatara he's coming down uh, to take a lowly form in a lowly position uh, so we we can take this also as a glorification of the lord that he is quite ready to take such a position uh, the the demons were very they were upset because they wanted to initially they were uh positioned in the back uh to pull the back of vasuki and they said no no we want to be at the head because the head is the important place Mm. Uh, and then uh okay you can you know whatever okay you can take that place if you like and then of course they suffer from the fire and the smoke coming out of vasuki uh incidentally i think we have to really also appreciate how much humor there is in this past time um uh, yeah. there's an awful lot of humor oh yeah i mean especially how the dem- how the demons are 
are represented. They're, you know, they're very childish, especially in this point. Oh, we want the front, not the back. Doesn't matter front or back, but they have to have the front. Okay, take the front. Uh, and then just the whole scene, if you picture it, it's actually quite humorous. You yeah. know, there's a tortoise, there's this mountain, there's these, um, these demigods and demons. Uh, what are they pulling? Not a rope, they're pulling a snake. Uh, there's uh, Vishnu on top with a thousand arms. <laughs> and then when it's all over and, uh, you know, there's the trouble with the, uh, the poison and then Vish they call in Shiva and he has to help them out. And then when finally the nectar comes, the fight over the nectar and then Mohini, and Mohini completely bewilders the demigods. Again, it's, it's, uh, it's a comedy. Yeah. It's a complete comedy how they're, you, you can just picture them sitting there with their mouths hanging open, staring lustily at Mohini Murti. Yeah. And, um, and then it's, it's humorous how Mohini Murti tricks them all, it's just one thing after it's a it's a it's a real comedy yeah that's true i never thought the mohini part i had thought of but the earlier part also yes it's true it's uh somebody's proud and possessive and then they become embarrassed by that by trying to grab the top position that's fascinating there's also one more thing you know in the christian tradition they talk also about how jesus pick up the cross and they often say that we all have to pick up our cross in life. We all have responsibilities, challenges, burdens. So here it's Kurmadev is, it's not a small cross, it's a mountain he's picking up. So the idea of carrying a burden, it's a, it's a huge burden to carry the whole mountain. And he does yeah. that for, for establishing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for the purpose of, uh, for the purpose of, like you said, humbly taking that role for the purpose of benefiting uh, who, those who are actually his servants, the, the devutas are his servants, but he's benefiting them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, now you mentioned also, you mentioned the transcendental purpose before of um, uh, scratching the itch on yeah. his back. And uh, of course, this points to the multi-purpose of the Lord, that the Lord fulfills multiple purposes in all of his pastimes. Mm. And in this case, uh, in this case, one of them we, one of them we may say is uh, a selfish purpose, uh, but the selfish purpose is, we could say, quite trivial. I mean, when we feel some itch on our back, you know, we just get something and we scratch and that's it. And it's not part of uh, cosmic history. <laughs> but when the Lord has an itch, yeah. when the Lord has an itch on his back, it becomes part of cosmic. It's a cosmic event. It has to be scratched. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I remember His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj, one of the first classes that I heard from him, he was talking about how, you know, Krishna sometimes when he gets angry, uh, he, he goes to a place where he wants to get some butter and the butter is hidden. He will, he will get angry and he will disrupt the place and sometimes he'll pass urine on, at that place. So then at that time... <laughs> Maharaj said that how many times in your life have you passed urine? And who who bothers about it? Who keeps a count about it? But when Krishna does it, that gets reported in the Bhagavatam. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Divine urination. 
divine for initiation yeah <laughs> amazing and uh, so now this churning which happens is there any now then at the end of it they get there is a poison and then we get the nectar now in some ways that represents the process of purification of the heart what krishna also says in the bhagavad gita initially there is what tastes like poison initially will taste like nectar eventually mm-hmm. so so while at that point their purpose is more to get nectar for uh, surviving in this world uh, or for flourishing in this world mm, but that process it remarkably parallels the process of purification and the process of attainment of krishna prema now that there are mm-hmm. there are obstacles like there is poison and there are also yeah. fringe, there are also fringe benefits and uh, it seems the devatas take the fringe benefits they allotted the devatas and the asuras but the key thing is they don't get uh, they don't get distracted by it they take the fringe benefits but they keep churning so similarly when we churn our heart we get we face a lot of problems and we also face uh, we also get some we may get some fame we may get some following we may get some some good things also now the devatas don't reject the good things but they they accept the things but they keep churning so mm-hmm. while that process is uh, process is for a we could say a mundane purpose but it seems the process is very similar to the process for getting krishna prem also in our yeah heart. that's yes that's that's certainly certainly the case but um it's interesting that uh when the when the poison comes out first um what do they do they immediately turn to lord shiva mm. and shiva is he's in his own category he's he's not jiva tatva he's not vishnu tatva he's not one of the demigods one of the regular demigods he's shiva yes and and his position as described in the bhagavatam is a kind of embodiment of compassion uh toward everyone he is completely uh equal to everyone he seems to be even more equal than vishnu in the sense that uh mohini murti is going to be partial to the demigods but shiva is impartial because he uh accepts the poison for the benefit of everyone beautiful yeah and he's also if we wanted to make a connection with i don't know if we want to but uh with christianity because the emphasis there is on uh divine suffering mm. so here we have we have a case of divine voluntary divine suffering he says okay uh i'll drink the poison because um we should always do things for the benefit of others <laughs> and he asks his he asks bhavani his wife for her approval and she approves but not before he's already decided that he's anyway going to do it mm that's interesting you know when you talk about that drinking of poison <laughs> that's beautiful and jesus also in the bible he says that let the cup pass so it does seem that uh, at that time one of the ways of uh, killing a person was giving them a po- cup of hemlock and that's how socrates was killed so but then mm-hmm. the next day he is given a more severe form of execution not just a poison but is put on the cross and crucified but the idea mm-hmm. of drinking a cup of poison or that that seems to be there in the the greco roman tradition where uh, where jesus in the context of which jesus spoke 
So mm. of course here there is no cup, but there is concentrated poison which he gets in his hands and he drinks it. So mm. yes, this is a beautiful parallel because one of the things which Christians often say is that God came as Jesus and He suffered like we have to suffer, like we suffered in the world. So in that mm. sense, He demonstrates His empathy for us. So, but then we have Lord Shiva also doing that. Mm. And yeah, I don't know if I don't know how much they would accept that parallel, but <laughs> there's <laughs> a kind of parallel. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not exactly he descending to like having a whole lifetime to suffer, go through worldly existence, but yes, that drinking poison is serious. Yeah. And, uh, so it's also uh, there that uh, Kurma after that he just. Uh, after the churning is done, he disappears. You know, there is no like expressing thanks, no expressing prayers, yeah. no expressing appreciation. So it's almost he doesn't speak, and nobody speaks to him. Also, it's uh, yeah, it's very mysterious. Yes, so it's almost like uh, for most people, God's presence in their heart, they don't speak to God, and God doesn't speak to them. Or, they don't hear God speaking to them. Yeah. Although God is sustaining the lives yeah. of everyone. But uh, yeah. so that's interesting. Now, I was thinking that there are there are Kurma temples, although not many temples of Kurma Dev. Mm. There are some temples of Kurma. And uh, it's uh, the, I think the Chaitanya Charitamu, there's a mention of Ramanacharya finds himself in a Kurma temple. And he thinks it's yes. a Shiva temple, so he stops. So he decides that oh, I, I don't want to be. I didn't want to go to Shiva temple, so he passes over there. So Kurma mm -hmm. is also worshipped, uh, but that worship doesn't seem to be very extensive. Mm -hmm. Like say we have Krishna worship mm -hmm. or Ram worship. It, there are few temples, but not many. And then just a few more parallels that Kurma is the that there are. In the Bhagavad Gita, there is the metaphor of Kurmo Angani Sarvashaha. Like a, a tortoise, all the, the yogi withdraws all the limbs. So is there any description? Right. Is there any description of the limbs of Kurma Dev also? That there is a, that it's the shell is mentioned, but there is not much further mention about anything else. In the in whatever architecture I have seen in various temples, traditional temples, they do depict Kurma Dev with his limbs. But uh, the Bhagavatam is that way quite silent about his description. So that, that hard yeah. shell it protects. Well, of course. Yeah. The Bhagavatam is very much a summary. Uh, you know, many things are just summarized. So I, I suppose... Uh, there would be something in the Kurma Purana, no? Yes, that is You would true. think if it's called Kurma Purana, there must be a lot about Kurma Dev there. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Is, is Kurma Purana one of the... Oh, it is one of the 18 Mahapuranas also. I'm just looking at it. I think it is, yeah. Yes. And now... Uh, at some places he is referred to as a tortoise avatar. Some places he is referred to as a turtle avatar. So he is referred to as the Lord Turtle or Lord Tortoise. Prabhupada usually uses Prabhupada uses both words. So it seems tortoises are more land. Yeah, turtles often they are more equipped for being in the waters. Hmm. Oh, I I don't know about that distinction. Okay. I, I thought they're kind of interchangeable words in English. I don't know. Yeah, it seems that biologically they are more suited for um, for water, staying in water. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and but but they are amphibious. Yeah, that's true. They are amphibious. And then there is one more reference, not exactly to a turtle, but when Lord Chaitanya goes into ecstasy. He sometimes withdraws all the limbs of his body. And then he yeah, that, that, isn't there even a term for that? Um, 
sort of kur- kurma bhava or something like that. Yeah, I remember that. I don't remember the exact term, but yes. In Bengali, they use the word for that. And this is... Mm. So the devotees also... I think the devotees also mentioned that. Now, oh Lord, you're manifesting kurma or something like that. Mm. Oh. Yeah. So now this theme of stability for a devotee... Uh, that idea that worshiping kurma will bring stability is that a, have you read whether that's an enduring theme in our tradition or was it for specifically for bhakti you not know, for bhakti and thakur it was mentioned that we say devotee i only know it i only know it from what you have mentioned already uh, oh, from okay. bhakti no thakur and bhakti siddhanta thakur okay um which doesn't that doesn't mean it's not there elsewhere <laughs> mm. but that's the only place i've heard <clears throat> um but it's kind of reasonable right yeah the idea of getting stability by worshiping the the stable the stable form of the lord um uh, it's a uh, interesting idea maybe we need that for um maybe we should have a a kurma temple for iskon to worship for stability of our society that's a that's a yeah that's a amazing thought we have narasimha temple for protection we have a narasimha deity for protection yeah. and protection is we could say more from like overt dangers but stability yeah. stability is a different kind of protection so yeah you know in the material world something is always happening and in our moment also things keep happening so yeah actually i would i would say stability and balance because something we seem to be challenged by a lot in our society is finding balance especially when there's some point of disagreement uh then we find different extremes and everyone wants to be over here or over there uh so maybe we should be worshiping kurma to get that balance <laughs> between the different that's uh, perspectives yeah. so stability and balance yeah it, it yeah. it's a big it's a big challenge that when we start prioritizing one thing it is it is it seems almost that to emphasize one thing it's almost like we have to uh not to just de-emphasize forget but, uh, de-emphasize but even deride the other things which yeah done yeah that's true and that also mm. happens, not just with opinions i said i think it also happens with projects sometimes Oh yeah, a big project, and then the devotees are neglected, sadhana is neglected, and so many other things get neglected by that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Now, another way we could think about this pastime of uh, the churning is in terms of world politics today, and. as we know vishnu advises um the demigods that they should cooperate with the demons uh to to accomplish their purpose and it seems like uh this is good advice for for the world today also that there's we may see ourselves in this party or that party um but maybe we need to find ways to really come together to cooperate for the benefit of everyone it seems like present day politics has become so dysfunctional of course i'm thinking especially in america because i'm from america um but i was also thinking of the present uh, pandemic in terms of the poison um so taking it taking a different way of reflecting on this p- 
pastime, it, it may be said that uh, the over endeavor of uh, of all the uh, all the powerful beings of this world, all of the um, you know corporate uh, managers and everything, um, in a way has produced has produced this uh, this pandemic. Um, just, you know, the whole industrial complex uh, has, has generated this, this uh, pandemic. And the question in my mind is, how, how is Lord Shiva going to manifest to swallow the poison? Beautiful. Or is he going to appear? Or is he saying... No, no, this is Kali Yuga. Forget it. Uh, you just, you're going to have to suffer. <laughs> True. But we could. Yeah, so now, in one sense, there has been a, it's a, not just, you could say, industrial complex, but there is also everything that associated with it. You know, zoonosis is resulted because of the industrialization of the meat industry. And this, yeah, it's we have literally we could say we humans have maybe usually the word churning has a positive connotation to bring up something better from it, but we have more like mm. disrupted the nature. So, yeah. but maybe by the Lord's grace, something good can come out of the bad also. So maybe the poison will be removed and uh, uh, something positive will come. Now when. It seems when Prabhupada was asked about the possibility of a third world war, uh, sometimes he said that, uh, you know, there's always trouble in this world, a third world war won't necessarily make people more spiritual. But then he also said that if, I think if we are prepared for it and we continue our Krishna consciousness, then people will be attracted. So do you see overall, uh, uh, because of the, because of the pandemic, say uh, some kind of increased uh, uh, spiritual exploration or at least a questioning about the meaning of progress or the meaning of life among people today? I like to think so. <laughs> 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 because um, <clears throat> recently I've come across um, some analysis from some uh, two psychologists who are um, in the field of what's called positive psychology. Mm. And uh, they are identifying different kinds of, uh, of emotional strengths. And uh, one category they call uh, strengths of transcendence interesting and th for this category they have five subcategories and uh, the first subcategory is appreciation of beauty uh, the second is gratitude the third is hope um, and uh, the fourth when I not remembering right now. The fifth one is a sense of uh, spirituality, by which they mean simply some acknowledgement of uh, transcendence, of there being a reality beyond matter. That's a very minimal uh, understanding. Anyway, my point is just that one of these features is hope, and so I like to try to cultivate hope uh, in the midst of uh, so much that one could feel hopeless about. And so to answer your question, yes, I hope so. I hope people are um, becoming more, more reflective, more thoughtful. I think there are... Uh, any number of uh, very insightful 
people who understand a lot about what what's wrong uh, with what's going on. And that's a good thing. We, we should appreciate and encourage whatever, whatever shows, even if we say, oh, that's just mode of goodness thinking. Well, we could use a lot of mode of goodness in this world. Um, we can say that's what dharma uh, is about. Establishing dharma is about uh, bringing people up from the lower modes to the higher modes. Uh, and of course, ultimately to Krishna, but step by step. Yeah, that's true. And in one sense, the while the Bhagavatam or the Vedic conception of history is circular, so in a sense, nothing improves, things go round and round. But actually, there is hope within it because the consciousness can become elevated. The Lord comes and delivers. And even when things go yeah. down too much, the Lord restores them to order even in this world. So there, yes. is definitely, there is definitely reason for hope and positivity. Yes, yeah. Man. So No, it's also been said, we cannot live without hope. We may have nothing else, but if we have hope, we can live. Yes. Now, hope is also strongly associated with a sense of purpose. Yeah. That when there is some kind of purpose, then there is okay. I can I can be a part of things will be better, and I can be a part of a small way a part of making things better. So yeah, yeah. Victor Frankl talks about that. Yeah, you know, logo logo therapy. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yes, man. So so we want we can say we can we need Kurma Dev to bring stability. We need Lord Shiva also to remove the poison. And we can hope <laughs> yeah. for the nectar to come to. So maybe the, yes. the nectar would be probably some kind of not just a vaccine to cure the disease, but maybe some understanding that leads to a higher consciousness. Where, that, that is what is wanted. Yes. Yeah. At the very least, you know, if people, if we start, uh, if we become more conscious of uh, of nature and life forms and say even stop in eat, stop having such indiscriminate animal slaughter and because most of the last pandemics have come from zoonosis so even the lesser killing of animals that could also be a significant step forward in uh, in the evolution of consciousness yes maharaj yes could could it could certainly be. Um, let's let's hope for a revolution in this regard, not just a small change. Yes, Maharaj, certainly. I hope for that. Thank you. As as Srila Prabhupada was saying, as Prabhupada was saying about the Bhagavatam, it bring it can bring about a revolution in the impious lives of the people. Yes, that's true. Yes, Maharaj. Was any concluding points you would like to? I don't want to take too much of your time. Or sh any concluding points you want to add, or should I try to summarize? It's a very diverse discussion. It's we had. Yeah, we went sort of all over the universe this time. No, you go ahead and make your famous summary. You're good at that. <laughs> I don't know how good I can be today, but yes, uh, I'll try. So we started with the special features of uh, of Kurma Dev. So we talked about how it seems that he doesn't speak. So as you said, he's a very silent avatar, and there are no prayers also offered to him. And then we started uh, the a lot of discussion we had on the non-literal aspects. So Kurma Dev is worshipped for stability by was recommended by Bhakti Thakur Bhakti Thakur. So in that we discussed about how Prabhupada. Uh, while presenting Krishna Bhakti in a relevant way, in a context where the Mahatma Gandhi and others were reducing it to myth or like a pious myth, uh, Pr Prabhupada spoke strongly about the literal understanding. Bhakti Nath Thakur, while say address, addressing Bhakti Chandra Chatterjee's attempts to bodlerize Krishna Lila, 
and to present things he 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 gave people a way to understand it non literally but also emphasize that there is a there is ultimately it has to be related transcendental level so we discussed about the uh, about various uh, so allegory this is more of a allegory metaphor would be more of a particular point of par parallel where allegory is a uh, is a narrative which in which uh, a certain abstract properties are personified to teach some things so chaitanya chandrodaya natak is like allegory at least there are allegorical characters in that and then with respect to the bhagavatam's first canto uh, the bull and the cow narrative you said that how there is a blurring of categories and the emphasis is on remembering and relishing krishna and so depending on even the acharyas don't talk so much about whether this is allegorical or not so depending on historical context certain things which we may consider very important uh in maybe 200 years down others may think that something else is very important so rather than focusing on what is considered contextually important we can be more saragrahi the essence seeking and focus on remembering the lord and then before that you mentioned how there are there are not only multiple avatars present in this but multiple avatars are cooperating in this past time then we discussed that it sees parshuram interacts with ram then in the spiritual world there seems to be some awareness of at least dwarka and vrindavan uh, but whether there is interaction between the various lokas and the various uh, devotees that's something which we don't uh, have clear mention and then we you mentioned about mandala and yantra so the kurma being present with the churning rod above him that is like a mandala and then we have the mandalas in the first canto where namisharanya is considered to be like the center of the universe then we have bhumandala in the in the fifth canto and of course we have ras mandala in the 10th canto and then it discussed also about the idea of the universal turtle or the turtles all the way that in our tradition uh, there is if we consider kurma to be the supreme lord and then kashyapa is the prajapati so from the prajapati everything comes so and and kashyapa and sorry and then kurma sustains everything so in that sense there are there is a parallel over there we also discussed a lot about uh, in detail about how the uh, the when when kurma appears so there is the churning in the 8th canto and there is the churning in the 10th canto the churning in the 10th canto of the butter is krishna is unifisently distributing the butter that is more for like relishing prema and in the 8th canto it seems to be more for establishing dharma although it's more for the purpose of establishing dharma the and sometimes the ends are considered more important than the means and i never thought of this point that this whole depiction is quite uh, humorous how the they the, the, the demons are sometimes very like, childishly childishly demanding we want to hold on to the mouth and then they get overwhelmed by the smoke and then they see mohini murti and they're bewildered by her and then there was uh, this uh, the we we talk some cross cultural parallels that uh, kurma is sustaining the earth sustaining the whole existence he is humble below everyone so in the christian tradition they have the idea of lifting up the cross the lord is lifting up the mountain himself and then there is the idea of drinking poison so lord shiva takes the poison so there is the idea of divine suffering and uh, lord shiva he is in one sense mohini murti is partial to the devatas but lord shiva drinks poison for the benefit of everyone so he is he is he is not he is neither jiva he is in a higher category so he is like the like the divine so he exhibits the divine munificence in an extraordinary way and then when we talk about uh, kurma for stability and you brought in is broader extra broader meanings of how in our movement we need stability and balance so that we don't get too fixated on one opinion and uh, condemn the other opinion or we don't get fixated on one project and neglect other aspects while pursuing that project and even in the world today the, the politics there is uh, there is so much polarization and politics become dysfunctional 
just as the Lord told the devtas and asuras to come together. So today also people that is a good advice for political leaders also to come together. And then lastly, just as uh, during the churning poison came out, and then the which Lord Shiva was needed. So it seems the way we have not exactly churned but disrupted the universe by by industrialization. So the pandemic could be like a poison, but uh, you know whether Lord Shiva will come and remove the poison. That is something which uh, we'll have to wait and see. We can pray, and that there is also stability, and that the world becomes more stable, and we can. And you talked about positive psychology and hope, and how we cannot live without hope. And there is also the aspect of there is spirituality, there is hope, there is gratitude, there is uh, uh, humor. So it does seem that this whole pandemic is making people think about higher consciousness and. So the meaning of life, the definition of the definition of progress, and if we have not just a evolution, but a revolution of consciousness, then yeah. then there will be a then there can be brighter times which can come. And they said Lord Kuruma Dev, he was invisible. He was is invis. He was he not exactly is he didn't speak, but he was there sustaining everything. So Kuruma is present. We can say like. The process of churning of the heart also parallel process of churning of the milk ocean parallels the process of churning of the heart for the manifesting of love of Krishna. So we can pray that you know humanity individually and collectively their heart gets churned and conscious. We can rise to a higher consciousness. So thank you, Mara. This was a breathtaking journey. What you took us on today. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for <clears throat> for participating. We. Together we did some churning. <laughs> there, by the way, is it's a detail, but there is one, one more mandala you can say in the Bhagavatam that I thought of in the sixth canto, uh, when Chitraketu Maharaj mm. meets Lord Shiva, he sees Lord Shiva with Parvati on his lap, and they are surrounded by the sages. Oh, okay. So that's a kind of mandala also. And of course, uh, that's the beginning of more trouble for Chitraketu. He he thinks it's very funny um, <laughs> that this is, I mean, we can picture that scene, all these sages and then Shiva, highly respected, but then Parvati is sitting on his lap. What is this? <laughs> so he can't help it, he laughs. And of course, Parvati doesn't think it's funny at all. Mm. And her not seeing the humor in it is also funny. <laughs> the fact that she doesn't see any humor in it, and in fact, she is offended and she curses Chitraketu. Uh, is also kind of humorous. And of course, Chitraketu very graciously accepts the curse. He says, okay, heaven or hell, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just thought that's another mandala. Yes, I think even in the 10th canto, when Krishna is sitting with the gopas to have lunch and Brahmaji sees them, that's also... Oh, yes, that's, that's the other... Mandala. Yeah. That's also a mandala, yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. Good to remember that. That's Bhagavatam is rich with this. I never thought of this dimension of mandala this way. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for your time. Yeah. And your sangha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. the best. So um, we'll we'll proceed next time with uh, Varaha Dev, huh? Yes, Maharaj. Definitely. I look forward to that. Okay. <laughs> Humble obeisance. Thank you. Shila Prabhupada. The key, yeah. Jai. Ananta Koti Vaishnava in the key. Gore Prema Nande. Haribo. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah.